Good afternoon, and welcome to today's webinar, Right-Wing Extremism in Canada. My name is Len Redner, and on behalf of the Canadian Race Relations Foundation, I am delighted to have you with us today. Before we begin, a few administrative details. We'll follow our usual format for webinars. We'll begin with the presentation of our guest, Evan Balbert, and at the end of the presentation, I will return to assist with the Q&A section of the program. As always, you may take your questions at any time during the presentation. My colleague, Sivaka Priyatarsan, and I will group or combine similar questions together in order to make the best use of our time. Thank you, and now let's begin. Canada has a rich history of right-wing extremism and neo-Nazism distinct from, but influenced by, United States and European hate movements. It's not nearly as fringe anymore. It has inspired terrorist attacks and there will continue to be casualties. Perhaps more dangerous is the creep of their ideologies, which are influencing our mainstream discourse and our politics, reducing the social consequences and thereby emboldening their proponents. For the first time since the World War II period, there's an officially recognized, obviously neo-Nazi federal party called the Canadian Nationalist Party. Their supporters overlap with the more mainstream People Party, People's Party of Canada, which has attracted hate group supporters with their anti-multiculturalism message. Hate groups that call for the murder of politicians and non-white Canadians are holding regular demonstrations in cities across Canada. We are in a cold cultural war right now with flashes of terrorism. The good news is that we have a playbook to win. It's just a matter of resources. This webinar will produce, or I'm sorry, will provide an overview of the state of hate in Canada, how it is being countered, and challenges and proposed paths forward. Our presenter today, Evan Balgord, is the executive director of the Canadian Anti-Hate Network. He is an investigative journalist and researcher covering the rise of the new far right and hate groups in Canada. He is a fellow of the Monk School of Global Affairs Fellowship in Global Journalism and graduated with an Honours Bachelor of Science from the University of Toronto, doubling a major in psychology and sociology. Before this, Evan was working as a special assistant to Toronto Mayor John Tory. He also served as Vice President of the Canadian Association of Journalists and is a non-academic affiliate of the Canadian Network for Research on Terrorism, Security, and Society. Evan, it's a pleasure to have you with us today. The floor is yours. Thank you, Len, and thank you to the CRRF uh, for the opportunity to, uh, to discuss uh, a very important topic with you. Um, so I represent the, the Canadian Anti-Hate Network. We are a, a nonpartisan, nonprofit uh, made up of uh, experts uh, in the issues of, of hate groups, hate crimes, and uh, that kind of activity. We have court-recognized experts, we have uh, lawyers, we have journalists, and we have individuals in the 90s and thousands that uh, stood up to hate groups um, in the last major kind of resurgence of, of this activity. Uh, we've been around for about uh, about a year and a half, and uh, we've had some good successes and uh, learned from places where we have not been successful, and uh, I'm going to share some of that with you today. So, as a brief overview of some of the things that we are going to discuss, um, and this it won't necessarily be in order because the different topics touch on each other, but in general, here's what we're going to discuss. We're going to go over some definitions. We're going to talk about the different hate movements we have here in Canada. We're going to talk a little bit about history. I don't want to dive too much into um, a, a lengthy historical discussion, but we will talk a bit about how we came to come here, kind of just to emphasize the point that this is, um, we're not just like uh, neighbors of the United States, we're not just at the whim of the United States and Europe, but this is a uniquely Canadian problem and a uniquely Canadian phenomenon. And luckily, um, we can solve it in a way that other countries uh, can't. We have different tools at our disposal. Right? I'm going to talk a bit about radicalization, um, more so when it comes to the neo-Nazi movements because they primarily target children, and uh, that's a bit uh, more concerning. We have a certain amount of time, so we'll focus on radicalization coming from that movement more so than the anti-Muslim movement, but I will touch on that. Then we're going to kind of discuss uh, mostly the history, because this is the important part. Um, from 2015 to today uh, for the anti-Muslim and the neo-Nazi movement. Of course, there's a much richer history than that. Um, they were active in laying the groundwork for kind of what picked up in 2015 before that. But for our intents and purposes, we're going to start with 2015 because that's the, the new wave. And of course, we're going to discuss 
present issues, present challenges, what is working to stop them, uh, and where we need to, to do more work. I'm also going to briefly touch on Quebec, and uh, we're going to use Hamilton as a bit of a case study on how a city and a police force can actually do such a, such a bad job when it comes to this stuff. It's much, much worse. So defining a hate group, we built our definition um, in line with the criminal code, the Canadian Human Rights Act, and the Charter of Rights and Freedoms, because we wanted to have a strong legalistic um, foundation. We would hope that um, law and potentially policy would look at our definition um, as, as a basis, right? So that's why we built it on these um, pieces of, of legislation and on our laws. So our definition is that a hate group is a group which uh, is, is overtly hateful towards and creates an environment of overt hatred towards an identifiable group, right? This is not, um, it's not a matter of, of being offensive. It needs to kind of, or even being violent. It's that it needs to target a group that is protected uh, by our laws against uh, against discrimination. Right? Um, our organization, the Canadian Anti Hate Network, um, we are a. Uh, sure, I can just uh, one moment. There we go. Uh, so the Canadian Anti Hate Network is a, a band-aid solution to these problems, right? Um, there are uh, significant issues of institutional and systemic racism or discrimination uh, in Canada, right? Um, we don't touch on that so much. Our mandate, and we're a band-aid solution, uh, really is to target the most overt forms of, of hatred uh, and hate groups. Um, pretty specifically, or those you know in their immediate orbit. That's our focus, and we do hope in that hope that by focusing on uh, the most overt problems, that we can send signals that, that would then reverberate and make differences, you know, with 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 more general societal racism, institutional racism, systemic racism. We would hope that our work makes ripples there and and, and helps more broadly. But really, we we see ourselves as a band-aid solution just trying to prevent and kind of fix the absolute worst of the worst, most overt, potentially kind of violent issues. So before I kind of get into what these hate movements are in Canada, um, I've, I've found it's very important to kind of focus on a few points. I mean, we're going to talk about, um, we're going to talk about the anti-Muslim and the neo-Nazi movements a lot because they're very active, they're very public. But I'm concerned sometimes that by labeling them anti-Muslim and neo-Nazi, which is accurate, but by labeling them that, we kind of lose a bit um, of who they target, right? We lose a bit of that understanding. So, you know, I might be calling something a neo-Nazi, I might be calling something an anti-Muslim, but I really want to emphasize here um, how much they target women. It's really a, uh, it's, it's very prevalent. I mean, the number of individuals in the anti-Muslim movement, for example, that we either know because of court violence or have had family members or friends or former friends, et cetera, come forward to us to tell us that that individual is, for example, uh, a white beater, right? Uh, or abused their children is, is very high. Um, in some cases, we have reported on it. In other cases, when we can't verify it, we don't. But we do get a number of those kinds of tips, and it's, it's concerning. Within the neo-Nazi movement, it's, it's also extremely prevalent. In fact, there's maybe only three times in doing this work um, that I have been very rattled um, by the kind of content that I was consuming. And I consume neo-Nazi kind of death cults, calls for, for murder content on a regular basis. I have a fairly thick skin, and I'm very privileged in not being part of one of the groups that they might uh, primarily target, right? Um, but that being said, one of the worst times when I was doing this work was actually uh, listening to a podcast, which I'll talk a bit about later, but it's called This Hour is 88 Minutes. And for a time, it was Canada's uh, kind of premier neo-Nazi podcast. And they would often talk about the need to deport or kill non-white Canadians. But the worst thing I ever heard from them, the most vitriolic comments they had was one episode where they actually talked about women in their own movement. Um, and it was absolutely disgusting, right? We're talking um, uh, very sexualized comments, very violent sexualized con uh, comments, comments how 
what their worth was to the movement was was you know they should be pregnant, they should be in the kitchen, they should be pumping out white babies, women should not vote, they should not be politically active. And you can imagine the kind of language that would accompany um, thoughts and comments like that. So absolutely disgusting. So I really do want to highlight before we move on that uh, hating women is a very primary feature of, of far right movements, as is often anti LGBTQ plus, anti indigenous, and of course hate towards uh, other non white uh, persons. Um, now, with that being said, you know let's move on to kind of the, the key movements. So I've lumped these two at the top here together: anti Muslim and these so-called, you know, Christian anti-LGBTQ plus movements, uh, because increasingly they are working together, and that's why I've kind of lumped them together. And I'll discuss that a little bit more. Um, we also are going to talk about the neo-Nazi movement. You know, it's, it's not necessarily as, as public, but it's very active. We have everything from what, what I call now, and it might be a little offensive to some of our uh, older colleagues, but I call the old school uh, neo-Nazi movement. Now I'm talking the 90s, I'm talking the thousands, I'm talking boneheads, I'm talking people that look like thugs, right? I'm talking, uh, you know, George Birdie, I'm talking uh, Bill Noble, I'm talking Paul Fromm, I'm talking Eric Sundle, I'm talking Heritage Fund, Hammerskins, that kind of styling, right? You're going to see more like metal music, you're going to see more random or not so random outbursts of violence both towards their own members and towards random non white people. That's that kind of old school movement. Uh, you will also find uh, neo Nazis within the anti Muslim movement. Um, and of course, we have the new alt right movement, which is a rebranding of neo Nazis in light of the 50th generation. And we have death cults, um, which are the kind of the worst of the worst. Um, they encourage people to carry out terrorist attacks, and we have terrorist uh, cells, we believe, here, here in Canada. Now, there are overlaps between, between these groups in different places. Generally speaking, um, the alt-right neo-Nazis and the death cult neo-Nazis do not really interact with the anti-Muslim and Christian anti-LGBTQ plus movement. Uh, there are exceptions, but that's just generally speaking. Uh, just like the kind of old school and anti-Muslim neo-Nazis don't really interact with those new movements either, but there are places where they do, right? That's not a hard and fast rule. We have seen old school neo-Nazis in all right neo-Nazi forums trying to appeal to a new generation. So there is an increasing interconnectivity, particularly around Wexit or, or Western Brexit, which is the new thing that uh, I hope you haven't heard of yet, but I'm sure you will soon, and uh, we'll go through that. So how did we get here? Uh, Canada has a long history of, of kind of far right and or neo Nazi activity. Um, in 1933, there was the, uh, the riot at Christie Pitts, uh, which, uh, you know, a, a Jewish uh, baseball team uh, and a Catholic baseball team were facing off, and some supporters of the Catholic baseball team who were also uh, members of, the, uh, uh, of what were known as, as, as one of the swastika clubs, unfurled a large swastika, kicking off Canada's, I believe, second race riot, right? Uh, many, many people hurt or injured. Next year, you know, Adrian Arcand in Quebec starts up the Christian National Social Party, uh, which is a translation of it, but basically uh, it's a neo-Nazi party. It was pro-Hitler, very pro-Hitler. Uh, he was actually jailed during the war for attempting to overthrow uh, the government. I have no idea how far it got, but uh, he was jailed during the war. Uh, and then he, he got out and he continued to kind of run on that platform. Now, there was also a significant portion of of kind of far-right activity in the 60s, which I'm just going to skip over here in the interest of time, and talk a bit more about the resurgence of the 90s and early 1000s, particularly marked by the Heritage Front Affair. The Heritage Front was a neo-Nazi group primarily based uh, in Toronto. Uh, it included a, a number of like the who's who uh, of neo-Nazis associated with it, you know, including Earth Sundle, including Paul Fromm, who's still around. Uh, unfortunately, a lot of the individuals kind of from this era uh, are still active, a surprising number. Um, I'd say at least half a dozen of kind of their um, more prominent ones are now rejoining the neo Nazi movement. They are encouraged for what's happening today. And, and one important thing to note here uh, throughout this whole time period, I mean, Adrian Arcan, for example, um, his Christian nationalist, sorry, Canadian nationalist, sorry, <coughs> pardon me. His, his neo Nazi party merged with a party in 1934 called the uh, Canadian Nationalist Party. 
And post uh, World War II, he started calling his party uh, nationalist uh, as well, right? The use, there's a consistent use of coded language, right? They will not say that they are neo-Nazis. They very rarely do. You know, it's about culture. It's about heritage. It's about nationalism, right? And that language has continued. And it's, it's, it's interesting if you read any sort of history of neo-Nazis or history of far-right extremism, that nothing is really new under the sun. I mean, the internet brought changes, but the ideology hasn't changed all that much. And how they talk about themselves, how they just how they argue over the optics of their movement or what language to use, they're using uh, they're pulling from the same bag of terms, right? That they have all this use. So um, it's it's quite telling if you read a bit of the history, um, you can kind of understand what's going on today. But today, you know, it's important. Uh, to note that right-wing extremism is the largest threat in Canada that it has been in living history. The Heritage Front, during those days, 90s, early thousands, um, they would have hate rock concerts. These would be uh, heavy metal concerts or, or, or National Socialist Black Metal, NSPM concerts. And they would bring out 500, 600 people, right? Uh, fairly large. Today, some of these anti-Muslim demonstrations have that number of people or more, and they're happening more regularly, right? Uh, that's and and it's much easier to join and to find these movements because of the internet, right? That's kind of the, the change, and it's possible to do targeted harassment campaigns on the internet. It's possible to make people fear for their lives, um, you know, by by digging up private information of them online and then using that information to threaten them, right? Saying, you know, we're going to find your family, and that is happening today. Canada has a long history of hate group activity, which is unique to Canada, uh, but it is influenced by, by other countries and influences other countries in turn. For, for example, today, Canada actually produces a disproportionate number of far-right thinkers and neo-Nazi propagandists, right? When Richard Spencer started his uh, alt-right website the first time, kind of brought the term into vogue, uh, he did it out of an apartment in Toronto. You know, Gavin McInnes from Toronto, he started the uh, the Proud Boys, um, which turned into kind of a violent street gang um, that has increasingly associated with and is now like very highly overlaps with the Nazis. Um, we have other uh, propagandists like that aren't necessarily like full blown neo Nazis themselves, but some of them are actually getting pretty close now, like Stefan Molyneux, for example, um, who is part of a pipeline that's been demonstrated by, by researchers now who looked at, I think, like uh, 7 million YouTube comments and uh, 390,000 videos, something something along those lines. And, and they demonstrated a link um, from these thinkers and propagandists on, on YouTube to people getting involved in neo-Nazism. And we'll talk a bit about more of that uh, later. Uh, so here's, here's our first picture we're going to look at. So this is the uh, pictures from the anti-Muslim movement. The top left, you're going to see a group called the Three Percenters. Um, they are an armed militia. Uh, they conduct training and they have staked out mosques, right? Uh, they see themselves as preppers. They are preparing for uh, the day that, that things go really bad. Um, but, you know, their, their be previous behavior staking out mosques is very concerning, as is the behavior of the American Three Percenters group, which uh, some members are apprehended planning to uh, firebomb uh, uh, a community center full of, full of refugees, uh, for example, Somali refugees. Um, and uh, their leaders have posted things like, um, you know, the only good Muslim is a dead Muslim. You know where they're coming from. The top right, uh, is, um, the Wolf Pack, um, perhaps Quebec's largest uh, anti-Muslim group. We can discuss them a little bit more later. In the middle uh, is the former Saskatchewan uh, chapter leader of the Northern Guard, which is an offshoot of Soldiers of Odin. Uh, you can see him posing in front of swastika flags. Bottom left, uh, members of the Northern uh, Guard. Uh, again, anti-Muslim group. They style themselves like a street or biker gang, and uh, they have been involved in assaults and violence. And surprisingly, bottom right, soldiers of Odin. You know, uh, one of the first groups to come here, and we're going we're gonna to kind of touch on that. So Canada's anti-Muslim movement is where we're going to start, and probably where I'm going to focus my most attention today, um, because it is probably the largest, most public group. And it's probably the thing that um, the average member of the public could maybe do the most about, or maybe there's challenges in addressing it, but also it's easier to address because it's more public. It's 
that makes sense. When we deal with some of the hardcore neo Nazi groups, uh, it's necessary to infiltrate them. For example, when we're talking about the anti Muslim movement, they do a lot of their stuff publicly. Um, both are dangerous. The anti Muslim movement, I was concerned at the time, still am, um, that it's the greatest potential for radicalization, greatest potential for somebody going off the deep end and, and carrying out a, a terrorist attack. I still believe that. Um, and we're going to get into why. So we're going to touch on the history a little bit, but again, focusing 2015 forwards. Important to note, though, that Islamophobia obviously did not start with patriots in 2015. Uh, for example, the Jewish Defense League, which is uh, basically an anti-Arab uh, pro-Israel uh, organization that has been involved in the anti-Muslim. So the Jewish Defense League, they invited speakers and bloggers that are part of what's recognized as the Islamophobia Institute. People like uh, Geert Wilders, Pamela Geller, and Tommy Robinson, and they invited these people to speak to Canadian audiences years before we had a street-level anti-Muslim uh, groups in Canada, right? I think around the same time or even before Tommy Robinson founded the Jesus Defense League, um, which turned into, again, a violent, a violent street movement, right? Um, the ideology of, of, of the anti-Muslim movement, uh, and again, all of these kind of uh, hate theories and, and ideologies, they were like conspiracy theories, right? And they would not exist without them. And here's the bare conspiracy theory. Um, they say that Islam is incompatible with the West. And they define the West as being uh, comprised of like Christian, Christio Judeo values or Western liberties, right? That they say is entirely incompatible with, with Islam and Muslim. And an important point here, right? They will say that they're, well, a couple of things. They will say that they're only being critical of the religion of Islam, right? That's a lie. And I'm going to give you kind of three points on that. So, first, even if that was true, Discrimination against somebody on the basis of religion is still against our charter. It is still bigotry, right? It doesn't matter what God you pray to. If you're going to discriminate against somebody because they pray to a different God, that is bigotry, that is discrimination. So that, that's the first point, right? They get around that by saying that Islam is a political ideology and not a religion, or by saying that they are only against political Islam, which is where they use the term of Islamism. So park that for a moment, right? Because they say that they are only being critical of Islam, but then they assume that brown people are Muslims, right? They have mistaken Arabs for Muslims and Indians for Muslims and targeted them for harassment because of the basis of their skin color, right? So when they say it's just religion and then turn around and harass a brown person assuming they're Muslim, you know, it's not just on the basis of their religion. It's classic racism. And third, you know, they'll say that they're only against Islam and not Muslims in public, but then online and in their private groups, they share posts celebrating or encouraging violence or murdering capital M Muslims, right? I'll give an example of when this was really clear. So I used to attend basically every single demonstration hosted by anti-Muslim groups in, in, in Toronto in 2017. And, and one of their key speakers at the time, a woman named Sandra Sullivan, was giving a speech with a megaphone in front of Toronto City Hall. And I actually used this in, in an episode, a Candleland podcast episode I produced, and I clipped this in case you ever look for that clip. So she said that they are only being critical of Islam and don't hate all Muslims, right? She's yelling that into the megaphone. And then literally she takes a breath. And the next thing she says, there are no moderate Muslims, all Muslims practice to Kia, all Muslims are lying about their agenda, right? The movement is, like not to mince words, these are dumb people, right? And there are inherent contradictions in, in what they say. In, I'm um, going you know, to refer back to Len here for just a moment. Len often gives a, gives a talk when he talks about historical anti Semitism, how um, to some groups, you know, Jews are whatever they need them to be. You know, they are either this ultimate evil or they are vermin. They are either communists or they are fascists. And like, to people who are bigoted and racist towards a group, they will paint them with, with multiple conflicting brushes in an attempt to demonize them, right? So, this is how it works. And, Kind of important thing with the anti-Muslim ideology is, is how they see themselves in Canada, right? They see that Canada was founded by white European peoples who deserve to be dominant, right? Sometimes they believe that their Canada can include indigenous people and model minorities, but only so long as they fully assimilate into their vision of Canada, right? They have to be model examples how they want people from those backgrounds to behave, right? 
non-white people are welcome in the movement as long as they kind of follow those rules. Uh, they believe that Muslims are bad for Canada either, you know, because uh, culturally they come from our language ship or third world countries where they don't have rights and don't understand how to treat women, yada, yada, yada. Um, so they think that, that they either come from that culturally or often the racism is biological or Muslims are biologically inferior. And then the key um, conspiracy theory here is that Muslims are plotting to take over. And our government, Justin Trudeau, jihadi Justin, is either too stupid to recognize it or more often complicit. He's working with the Muslim Brotherhood. He's working with globalists. He's working with Jews or some combination thereof to destroy Canada um, through third world migration. Um, the anti-Muslim movement, we're going to talk about how they have gone through a timeline and changed different things, but um, they really hate and target anti-fascists and anti-racists, and that might be a good thing, because now at least they're not demonstrating in front of the mosques. Um, I'm going to skip over that in the interest of time. We do have subgroups in the anti-Muslim movement. There are religious and non-religious aspects of it. The religious are mostly um, uh, very conservative Christians and Jews. Um, some of them see themselves as anti-LGBTQ and others do not, but they still associate with anti-LGBTQ persons. Uh, there are non-militant and militant groups. The non-militant groups often host events, the militant groups attend and then commit violence. Uh, and there are neo-Nazi groups and groups that knowingly associate with neo-Nazis, but then there are also groups that view themselves as against Nazis and fascists in combinations thereof. And there have been divisions in the movement because of this, because they don't want to be hanging out with Nazis, but they are. They don't want to be associated with Nazis, but they are, right? And there's a lot of cognitive dissonance there that has led to fractions of the movement, which I will discuss. Here's one example of one of the less militant groups, which is Pegida. Now, Pegida will hold a demonstration, people will come out to it, and then things like this will happen. Uh, here's a brawl in the Eaton centers. Here you have a uh, uh, homophobic hate preacher kicking somebody in the face. We have Chris Vanderwide, uh, also known as Pan Man, who was later arrested for, again, uh, unprovoked assaults on anti-fascists. You have a member of the Canadian Nationalist Party um, in the background. So you'll have militant hate groups kind of come to people at militant events and they commit violence. And often there's mutual support between the anti-Muslim movement and the anti-LGBTQ plus movement as demonstrated like in this picture. So, uh, when hate groups wanted to march on Church Street in Toronto uh, last month, for example, anti-Muslim groups joined the hate preachers, and they were halted by, by anti-fascists and ultimately prevented from marching on Church Street in that example. Um, the social media ecosystem of the anti-Muslim movement is greater than mainstream media, right? Uh, in Canada, there is also mainstream news that really promotes their agenda. We're talking rebel media, we're talking some content on, on post media, mostly I'm talking op eds, uh, True North, and so on and so forth. Uh, several of their content producers have been charged, uh, which we'll get into when that works and that doesn't work. Uh, despite things like defamation suits and charges, some individuals will not stop, right? Kevin DeJohnson is one example, Rick Boswick is another. Um, Rick Boswick and Lily were some of the people that targeted the Alice Susan family in Toronto. I'm sure uh, many of you have heard the story. Basically, um, there was an event uh, in Hamilton for the People's Party of Canada. It was counter-demonstrated by uh, anti-fascists. Some anti-fascists blocked an elderly woman who was crossing the street. Um, the son of the Al-Sufi family was there. He was not yelling at the woman. He was not actively blocking her. He's there. He's in the frame. He's in the viral video that went very, very viral, uh, originally posted by you and I, actually. Um, so that was actually not when that crowd can't be started a lot of Right? That was not when the LCP family started being targeted. They were actually targeted weeks earlier by Rick Boswick, by Lily, because the son went to one of Rick Boswick's court dates because he threatened, uh, he threatened an anti-fascist. So his son went to one of those court dates just to monitor it. Uh, he was filmed by Lily and maybe also Rick in the courtroom, which is illegal, by the way. Um, they're trying to press charges against that. Uh, and as a result, though, because he was there, because he spent another demonstration, they started targeting him, his restaurant, his family, well before that PPC event, right? But things really kicked into another level with that PPC event, and, and the family started receiving serious serious damage, right? And closed down for a time. Uh, trajectory. So here's like the brief history, uh, of recent history of the anti-Muslim movement. So 
uh, any time that uh, somebody is elected that appears to be more progressive, more pro-multiculturalism, um, there's usually a backlash uh, with, with hate groups, with right-wing extremist groups. This happened when Trudeau won the first time, and uh, a lot of these groups started up uh, online. Uh, international groups, European anti-Muslim groups, Pegida and Salt Sabot, they arrived, they had some presence and actually some physical membership in Canada, but they failed to launch some of their, uh, Pe some of Pegida's first demonstrations were very vigorously counter-demonstrated by anti-fascists, and they failed to launch. In 2016, Trump was elected, a lot of energy and activity online groups explode online, right? There's more groups, there's more people involved, uh, and online groundwork is laid. Uh, they don't have anywhere to go with this energy just yet, right? 2017, a uh, liberal government through, through MP Ipokali introduces Motion 103, which uh, generally speaking is a motion to condemn Islamophobia. Rebel media says this would criminalize uh, dissent, criminalize criticisms of, of Islam, and of course they're already super, super anti-Muslim promoting racism towards Muslims, right? Uh, which they're actually subject to a criminal complaint about right now. Um, so they're fear-mongering about it. They hold a conference in Toronto and a street-level movement is born with groups like Pegida and several others that would spring up, the Canadian Combat Coalition, the Canadian Coalition of Canadian Citizens, uh, uh, Soldiers of Odin, you know, many other groups involved. Um, so the street-level movement is born. There are regular demonstrations um, in front of City Hall in Toronto, but this spreads to, and also organically started in other cities in Canada as well. Uh, flash forward a little bit. Uh, we do this work, me, colleagues of mine, friends of mine, you know, sources. We, we really expose the, the neo-Nazism within the, um, this anti-Muslim movement, right? Um, and that was because there were groups in that movement that, wouldn't, that very much hate Muslims but would not be cool with neo-Nazis. Uh, not knowingly, at least. Not, well, that's not even quite true, but not when you really rub their face in it, right? Really make it obvious to them. So there were groups um, that left the, the anti-Muslim movement by and large uh, because uh, we exposed several uh, groups in that movement of being, being neo-Nazis. And we're gonna touch again on what's effective in stopping these groups and whatever, but, but this was very good. Right, because the movement itself was basically cut in half, and they have not been able to hold demonstrations nearly the same size in Ontario since then. Because there's a lot of infighting between different groups over, oh, you're cool with Nazis, and you're not cool with Nazis, and the movement fractured. It's not gone very much, and I'm going to get into that, but it fractured. Um, around the same time period, the focus also shifted from M103, which at this point was kind of a done deal, it's a dead issue, right? The focus shifted to the Prime Minister, to Trudeau, to the Liberal government. Because right? these people are also very, they're very far right, they're very uh, conservative or right of conservative, and they, they were thinking politically at this point. Now, so they started focusing the demonstrations on, on Trudeau. Now, they still very much were against Trudeau because of Muslims, because that was their prime issue, but the focus did shift. Um, eventually, this culminated in the birth of Yellow Vest Canada. So in France, there was a, a Yellow Vest movement that was, uh, had a variety of issues it dealt with. It was a grassroots movement. They, the hate groups in Canada tried to copy it, but it was basically just hate groups here. They did suck up some people who were like vanilla far right, but primarily this was an anti-Muslim movement. Hardcore Islamophobes that attracted the MS. We did our best to expose this. Mainstream media was very slow to get the message there and very slow to do their own research on it. And um, that resulted in a situation, for example, where they were endorsed by, by Andrew Scheer. To this day, still refuses to acknowledge that um, he endorsed a group that is full of hate groups that called for the death of his political opponent, which has no place in our politics, right? He still refuses to apologize for that. Now, they also discuss at this time and earlier, but getting involved in mainstream politics. So, the People's Party of Canada springs up and all these people are involved, right? They're all in. There are a lot of discussions about whether they support or vote for the Conservative Party of Canada or the People's Party of Canada, and most of them ultimately decided on the People's Party of Canada being the most kind of extreme, mainstream-ish, still pretty fringe party, right? Um, we exposed a whole lot of that. Um, the election was just a really awful coming out of, of neo-Nazis and, and hateful individuals politics, invited by certain groups, which we're going to get into, uh, but 
Thankfully, they didn't win at the ballot box, but that doesn't mean the issue is over. So we'll touch on that more. Trudeau, of course, was re-elected. They are, of course, very unhappy. What's next on our radar is Hamilton and this Western Brexit position. So speaking with Hamilton, I could give an entire presentation on Hamilton, so I'm going to be condensing a lot here. Um, basically, the issue in the city, uh, there are regular anti-Muslim demonstrations stretching back through that whole time period I was talking about. These demonstrations are counter-demonstrated by anti-fascists. This really came to a head when Hamilton Pride was, it was very violently disrupted by hate preachers, anti-Muslims, and Nazis. They all came together to disrupt Hamilton Pride. Uh, a number of anti-fascists were there to um, block these people with a black screen, essentially. Uh, one of the hate preachers ends up sucker punching one of the anti-fascists uh, who's holding a corner of the banner. Uh, and, and there is a violent uh, brawl. Uh, the police are very slow to respond. They later say that was because they weren't invited. Um, and more so than that, eventually they do uh, arrest one uh, hate group member who is being very bad at assaulting people. But they also primarily targeted the anti-fascists who were there to defend pride, including an individual named Cedar, who they arrested saying that that person had violated uh, their bail conditions, not bail, um, but uh, well, I, they, but they violated conditions by being at Pride. Uh, and then later on, um, that wasn't the case. That person was never there. And then later on at, at the court, they, uh, they said it was actually because he gave basically an anti speech um, at City Hall at an event discussing the police response to this issue. Um, and uh, the case was thrown out, but Cedar spent, uh, I think, three or four weeks uh, in jail. Uh, which was looked politically motivated by the Hamilton Police Service, right? As a result of kind of how the Hamilton Police Service have been really heavily focusing on anti-fascists and Hamilton rather than hate groups, hate groups believe that they have support of the Hamilton Police Service. This has made things much, much worse. There are more demonstrations. In fact, I believe uh, just last weekend, Lily wanted to have a demonstration thanking the Hamilton Police, right? So uh, Lily being one of the primary kind of members of hate groups in Hamilton. Sorry if I didn't uh, explain that. Um, so hate groups believe they have the support of the Hamilton Police Service. Um, they're having more events, right? And this is attracting events to Hamilton, which is why it's become kind of the front line, and it's why hate groups think that they can attack people with impunity um, in Hamilton, because they think the Hamilton Police Service will treat them with kid gloves. So the PPC event happens. Um, there is footage of alleged assaults by Bernier's security, in fact, uh, and Proud Boys who punch people in the face. Um, None of those appear to have been followed up on by the police, despite complaints to the police. Uh, meanwhile, they have charged for uh, anti-fascists um, uh, using a variety of laws, one being you know, uh, uh, that they were wearing masks. They charged the son of the al-Sufi family, uh, despite, you know, we had a lawyer review that video and said, you know, that kid did nothing criminally wrong. Um, and, you know, it's our belief these are very trumped up charges. Um, and and this is the problem, right? Because now hate groups are celebrating and planning more events in Hamilton. We are trying to address this kind of at every level, and we think a lot of uh, pressure needs to put on the Hamilton Police Service right now. It is not like this in police services around Canada. Um, it's kind of different service to service, but Hamilton Police Service is a significant issue leading to hate group activity in Ontario, right? Very big problem. And um, it's going to be necessary to put pressure on them, and it's going to be necessary to, and, and we hope, um, that the Canadian Civil Liberties Association will join us in, in calling, uh, well, recalling kind of, and, and making sure that an independent investigation happens of their actions. Here's a picture from the main guy who's doing like the Western exit movement, the Wexit movement, right? It's kind of leading us to the war. So Wexit is basically the new Yellow West Canada. It's key organizers, um, Peter Downing, Islamophobe, Pat Kay, literally has a black sun on the back of his pickup truck, which is a neo-Nazi symbol. He's also very anti-Semitic. Um, they have over 200,000 page likes, which makes this twice as large as the LMS Canada. This might have more legs than the LMS Canada in an issue. Um, other organizers are supporters and sympathizers of Patriots. In Peter Downing, one of these key organizers, was fired from the RCMP for uttering threats. There's also reported allegations of drinking on the job and sexual harassment. Pat King, again, anti-Semitic. So we're concerned that this is following a similar, similar trajectory as the LMS Canada movement, and we are going to see more demonstrations. And comments on the page are similar to what we saw in the Elvis Kennedy as well. You know, quote, Jihadi Justin's inverted influx of sand niggers will be the end of a peaceful life in Canada, end quote. Quote, why the hell ain't 
that pitch MP if we're fully again. Right. So very similar content, very concerning content, um, and we determine what goes from there. Um, Canada's neo-Nazi movement, right? And I know that I'm running low on time here, so I will do my best to be to, to kind of condense this. Um, I think we covered most of the important stuff in the anti political movement. So um, Canada's neo-Nazi movement. Basic ideology has always been the same. Jews, non-whites, gay people, women, et cetera, are responsible for basically all of society's problems. Um, and that, that this is organized, you know, it's not just an accident. There is a secret Jewish cabal trying to do all this, right? They believe stopping this is going to require violence and there's becoming race war. Uh, where they differ in the different neo-Nazi movements is, is, is how that'll happen, and I'll get into that. Right, so we're going to skip ahead to the kind of the terrorist cells, which we're very concerned about. Um, so there are neo-Nazi death cults that are active in Canada. They believe in what's known as accelerationism. Accelerationism is the, the need to take violent actions now to trigger a, a race war sooner. And they encourage attacks on infrastructure, but also terrorist attacks, right, uh, against soft targets. We'd be talking mosques, we'd be talking synagogues. Uh, they are the most extreme of the extreme. We have, we have groups like these in Canada, FKD, AWD, the base. They are putting up posters and trying to recruit here. Um, this siege culture, siege is a book. And the most recent version of it was edited by Zyger, who's a Canadian. He was exposed, he fled. We don't know where he is, he's hiding. Um, so there are many individuals who believe in this neo-Nazi death cult stuff. They believe in the need for violent actions to uh, trigger a race war, to make serious political gains. They believe in making things so bad that then their ideology can take power. Uh, so there's many individuals like this around the world, but also in Canada that aren't necessarily affiliated with groups. And they're the ones I'm perhaps most concerned about because they're consuming the propaganda um, and, uh, you know, they may act on it. And, for example, here are the posters that are going up uh, in Canada. On the left, you know, our patience has its limits. They also have slogans like, um, turn your sadness into rage. Black lives don't matter. Um, and, you know, there's a reference there to the, the picture from the telegram from the, the Turner Diaries, which is old school neo-Nazi kind of fan fiction. Um, I'm going to skip a bit over this, this trajectory just to focus on the important part here at the end, which is that uh, they have now entered our politics. Uh, there is now, for the first time since, uh, since Adrian Arcan, uh, a, a officially recognized, obviously neo-Nazi federal party called the Canadian Nationalist Party. Uh, now, while they got basically no votes and only ran three candidates, right, they get certain benefits for being a, an officially recognized federal party including that their donors get um, significant uh, rebates from the government for making, you know, like a political donation. So the government, by allowing them to have become a political party, is now helping fund neo-Nazism. And this party has attracted hardcore violent neo-Nazis, right, uh, including individuals from the 90s and thousands that were not active again until now. You know, they're encouraged what's going on now, they're rejoining the movement and they're circling around the Canadian Nationalist Party. Uh, they also talked about entering through the People's Party of Canada. The, uh, one of the very first organizers, one of the first 250 people to sign their, their paperwork was um, an individual named Sean Walker. He's the former leader of a neo-Nazi group called the National, uh, National Alliance in the United States, very large, very prominent. And he actually did jail time for organizing racially motivated assaults. Um, that individual, helped form Bernier's second riding association, you know, riding executive, where he sat as the leader of that riding executive until, um, until he was exposed and removed from the party. Now, several, he might be the worst of the worst, but there are several bigoted individuals either associated with neo-Nazis because they share neo-Nazi blog posts or very strong phobic that were, of course, not removed from people's party of Canada because that's their party. Um, they have a strategy now when we're talking about the alt-right neo-Nazi movement, not the, not the terrorist, like they still can be terrorists, but not the most hard the alt-right neo-Nazi movement, the young movement, the new thing. Um, you know, they do things like this now. They do like banner drops. They do secret events. They're too afraid to go in public and be confronted by anti-fascists. So they get together and like take photos together. Um, you know, they coalesced around Faith Goldie when she ran for mayor in 2017, 2018 that time as Sloan. 
Uh, but for example, second from the left there uh, with the, I don't know what you call that, mustache and uh, soul patch. That's Derek Horn. He was paid security for, for Maxime Bernier. He went with them to a number of events. He was also a founding member of that Canadian Nationalist Party, that openly neo-Nazi party, right? He was also Bernier's like security guy. He went with Bernier to um, his media availabilities when he was talking to like, editorial boards across Canada. He was paid by the party and flown around by them to do that work, right? Um, so that's kind of who the PPC associates themselves with. Um, so neo-Nazis are very purposely targeting children and very young adults, um, right? Here's this article from 2018 where they're talking about how, you know, the left fucked up and how the uh, neo-Nazis are going to radicalize and take their children from them. Um, they, there's different pipelines for this to occur, and it often happens uh, entirely online. Uh, you can see this in the schools, right? I've talked to teachers. Once they know how to spot it, they tell me, holy crap, like this is all over my school. And I tell them, yeah, I'm not surprised, right? Um, so there are different pipelines to get these children into the neo-Nazi movement. Um, a lot of it happens on YouTube with these uh, so-called intellectual dark web, so-called classic centrists and called alt-light philosophers or speakers. And there's demonstrated links that like, if, if people start consuming that content, they're much more likely to make a full jump to like full-blown neo-Nazi content. There's also other online paths, but one of the main um, pipelines I want to focus on here is the misogyny and race realism pipeline. So this is the most gradual pipeline. It's maybe the, the, the easiest to, to interrupt simply because it's the most gradual pipeline. Um, oftentimes you'll see children making like, and, and teachers and, and parents should look out for this stuff, but it's when, when kids are like making arguments about why there is no gender wage gap, why women's biological preference is to like pump out kids and be at home, right? Misogyny. Often they'll go from starting to accept pseudo arguments, pseudo scientific arguments about misogyny to accepting similarly framed arguments about race realism, about why some races are biologically inferior. And at that point, you know, if they're just one step away from being only an um, I'm only going to touch on Quebec very briefly to say um, I am not bilingual. I am afraid I, I should be, I am not. Um, there are people in Quebec that do better work. We mostly focus on English speaking Canada because there are people in Quebec that do very good work. I will just say that there's a very active anti-Muslim movement in Quebec. It is promoted kind of by their, their trash radio and even within their politics by things like Bill 21, which has gotten them, you know, the support and the endorsements and the organizing of hate groups. And there is a neo-Nazi, neo-fascist group called At The Malt, which is maybe one of the most concerning open groups in Canada. They have a fight gym. They do fascistic kind of marches. Um, they have assaulted people in the street while putting up posters. They have crashed into the, when I say crashed into, I don't mean with a car, I mean that they've entered uh, vice media offices because they wrote a negative article about them. Um, they are scary types. They are, they are neo-Nazis and they are kind of a bridge between old school and, and new school. Right, and this is kind of a, what they look like sometimes. So, let's move on to what's working, right? Um, Anti-fascism, as a, as a quick note of what is anti-fascism, right? Um, I am an anti-fascist. You should be too. Uh, anti-fascism should be the default. Anti-fascism is basically synonymous with, with anti-racism, right? Now, anti-fascism as, as a concept has been, has been demonized. Uh, it has been demonized by people who uh, want to promote kind of racist agendas, right? Or people who are sympathetic to them. Uh, anti-fascism is not quote-unquote Antifa. Antifa uh, is how some groups choose to identify themselves. It's an older, shorter form way of saying anti-fascism, but today it has entirely been demonized uh, and made synonymous with what are black bloc anti-fascist tactics. Uh, black bloc tactics basically are uh, masking up and taking uh, direct actions, often vandalism, kind of when you're talking about PA stuff and things like that. Now, that is one very small section of, of anti-fascism. Uh, anti-fascism is a very um, broad-based activity. Most of it involves work like, uh, like what I do, uh, which is researching these groups and exposing them, right? Putting pressure on hate groups is important, and, and when anti-fascists stand up in their communities uh, to take direct actions, and by direct actions, I don't mean violence, I mean to stand up and be counted when there are hate groups in their communities to go and capture demonstrate. You know, they are there to reestablish pro-social and anti-racist norms to make there be a social consequence um, for uh, supporting hate groups or racists. 
And that talks, that, that leads me into like, what is effective? Oftentimes, exposing individuals who want to stay anonymous in their hate is effective, right? Because when you expose somebody, then they have to answer their family, they have to answer their friends, they have to answer their employer, like, why are you making posts saying the only good Muslim is a dead Muslim, right? I don't think you're a good fit for this workplace. And that's a natural social consequence for sharing these views publicly, right? Um, likewise, deplatforming works. Um, so deplatforming is when, you know, I might find out that a hate group is going to have an event at venue, and I'll call that venue and be like, here's information on that group, here's why you don't want to host that group, right? Oftentimes venues will say, oh wow, I had no idea, thank you for letting me know, yeah, we're not going to host that group. Sometimes they'll be afraid to break the contract, at which point we might politely point out that, you know, this is going to become public, uh, and people who frequent their business might not appreciate that uh, they held an event with me or not. Um, right, and that's that's the right of anybody to say, you know, people might not, you know, we boycott, and uh, and oftentimes that works. Now, when exposing individuals doesn't work, right, when those social consequences don't work because people are unapologetic, that's when we need legal consequences, right? Uh, and I'm going to talk about that in the next slide. So, challenges and opportunities. So, our organization and the people that we partner with and work with are usually very successful in stopping hate group activity or disrupting hate groups or exposing hate groups um, and ultimately limiting their influence or making face you know, financial pressures or legal pressures when we have the time to do it. Um, we are not the only organization of our kind that kind of does this uh, in Canada, but we are the only kind of professionalized one you know, that is an incorporated organization uh, that um, receives information from a variety of sources around Canada and, and acts on it, right? Uh, there need to be more of us. And other than myself, um, I do not believe there's anybody else in Canada that is, that is paid to do this work. And that's a problem. Because we have sources, we have tips, we have volunteers across the country. And there are anti-fascists in every community that, that are gathering up this information uh, or, or standing up tape groups in their communities. But in terms of we, we, need, we, need, we need basically staff. We need, we need people that it's their full-time job to um, collect that information, to monitor these groups more proactively, and then to use that information um, either to get the word out you know, by writing articles or by lobbying or by talking to venues about why they shouldn't do these events and, and so on and so forth, right? So we are usually very successful. Uh, I'm going to go back up one slide. You know, we shut down Canada's largest neo-Nazi podcast this hour is 88 minutes an article that we did with Vice Canada exposing the hosts. Uh, Zyger, when he was exposed, he, he fled. Uh, Faith Goldie, when, when we, you know, kind of spoke about her mailty campaign uh, and then uh, prevented her ads from being aired, uh, we ended up costing her $93,000, right? Um, which is great for an organization that I think our operating budget last year was like less than $30,000, right? Um, we shut, uh, and more recently, the most Recent iteration on Neo-Nazi podcast, the, the Ensign Hour, uh, has gone dark because uh, because I'm trying to sue the individuals there for, for defaming me personally. Um, so that's just to say that like we, we've had a lot of really great successes, and it's not that it's not just us that do that. We couldn't do that without tons of members of the community that bring us information to help us with this stuff. But the point is that those of us that are doing this work are extremely burnt out right now. Um, there's so much demand for our um, for our action, but we simply do not have enough people and enough time in, in the day to, to do this kind of work, right? So the biggest challenge that we have is resources. Um, we need action right now. We do not need the government to continue to fund academic research. That's not a bad thing, but we need to be funding um, stopping haters, right? Um, we need uh, better laws. We need Section 13 to come back. We, we have an issue here where if there are unrepentant hate mongers, we can't really hold them legally accountable because we don't have a great legal system to do that. And as a result, they just keep going and keep going and keep going, despite what they're doing being clearly criminal um, against Section 319.2, for example, or, or defamatory, there's no mechanism to stop them. And, and they are directing harassment campaigns such as towards the al Sufi family, which is causing them to fear for their lives, right? So we need better laws. We need Section 13 to come back. Um, we need to prevent political entryism, you know, by neo-Nazis. The Canadian Nationalist Party should never have been able to become a political party, but we never have or had any, any rules in our Elections Act to keep them out, and that was the problem. It's actually pretty easy. I could go start a political party in like a month, uh, no problem. And
and, and that's kind of a problem because we need to, Germany has laws, for example, which keep out political parties which are neo-Nazi and fundamentally anti-democratic. And we should have that as well. Now, I don't think that law should apply to something like the People's Party of Canada. I don't think uh, as bad as they are, they probably don't reach that extreme, but it certainly should keep out parties like the Canadian Nationalist Party. There's an important balance to be struck here between democratic participation and access uh, and keeping literal neo-Nazis out of our politics, right? Because then they end up getting funded and get other benefits once they're an official party. We also have an issue with, with schools, right? Schools are the front line, but uh, teachers don't know how to spot this stuff. Uh, school uh, educators, uh, principals, they don't know how to spot kind of the warning signs of radicalization or the signs that kids are getting involved in this stuff. Um, we could solve that problem, right? We could develop a curriculum, we could work with other groups and develop a curriculum uh, or develop training guides for, for teachers and kind of get those widely distributed. And we'd love to do something like that. It just, again, it comes down to an issue of, of resources, but we need educational materials like those um, to be in schools. And then uh, hopefully we can keep a bunch of children from getting uh, involved in this. And I apologize for taking so much time off the top and uh, kind of rushing through the second half that I do. Um, so I hope uh, if there's anything else that you want me to expand on, perhaps I can address that in the, uh, the questions part. And uh, I'll meet myself now and uh, let you pick it up. Okay. Thank you very much, Evan. Uh, we, uh, we have received a couple of questions uh, from uh, our listeners. And I encourage those people who have submitted to submit more. Those who are waiting to see uh, what questions others come up with, don't wait. Ask your own questions. So, Evan, uh, so uh, the first question from uh, one of our audience members is, what is the best means of reporting hate crimes and or organized hate groups? Okay, good question. Um, hate crimes is something I could almost do an entire uh, hour-long presentation on itself, so I will, I, will, I will cycle that urge and try to be brief. Our hate crime statistics in Canada are absolute garbage uh, because they are police-reported statistics. There's a lot of issues with those statistics. The real numbers are anywhere between 20 and 100 times higher of what's reported. Now, this situation can be much, much improved, uh, and, and it looks like all kind of political parties are getting this, and they'll be pushing for this in government. But basically, uh, we need the general social survey. Statistics Canada does a survey every year. Maybe some people on this call have, have, have done it before, where they ask you general questions. Every five years, they ask questions about, you know, have you been the victim of a hate, hate crime? And they just need to do that every year. And then we'd have a really good snapshot of what's going on. And of course, it's not just that question. They should ask a few surrounding questions, but that would make a really big difference. Now, in reporting a hate crime, either if you've been a victim of it or if um, you were aware of one, uh, yes, you can contact the police and, and file a hate crime. Unfortunately, you're going to have to kind of push. Uh, and this gets difficult. Police are sometimes reluctant to take reports of hate crimes, and it's almost impossible to report a hate crime on behalf of somebody else. So if somebody's not comfortable going to the police, there's a big issue here that their concern may never be heard. May never be heard. Um, community groups are sometimes able to leverage pressure on the police um, to look at a problem, even if the, the complainant won't directly deal with the police. Jewish community is quite good at that happen occasionally for Muslim community, but it takes quite a lot of pressure. Um, so if you have personally been the victim of hate crime and you're willing to speak to the police, then you should contact them. You should also contact uh, whatever groups represent you locally uh, to make them aware and ask for any assistance. Uh, but you are also going to, you have to prepare yourself to be a self-advocate. Unfortunately, that's the reality. Um, you're going to have to push to make sure that report is held. You're going to have to push to make sure that what happened to you is investigated. It is a big barrier and a big problem. Um, and I'm sorry. That's, that's okay, Th thank you for that, Evan. Uh, in your presentation, uh, you talked about uh, pre-platform, deplatforming rather, as a as an effective technique, and you also made reference to uh, to Section 13, which was the section in the Canadian Human Rights Act uh, that controlled hate on the internet. Uh, I guess the question that comes to mind, and perhaps you alluded to this when you referred to universities, is how do the, these effective actions get balanced against, uh, against freedom of speech issues? Um, you know, uh, who watches, I suppose it's a, it's a version of who watches the watchers. Sure. So, I mean, there's a few different ways to address it, but uh, let's talk legal for a moment, right? Um, uh, there was a recent finding out of Ottawa that, uh, for example, 
a library had no obligation to provide a venue space to screen an Islamophobic film. The library made the principal decision not to screen this film. They were challenged by the people who wanted to screen it, basically for breaking a contract, essentially, right? Mm -hmm. And um, uh, the court found that this was not a charter issue because they were creating a private event. And that's really important. That's this public space, private space distinction, and that's where the charter kicks in. So when a university or a library provides a private room, especially if it's ticketed, where media are not welcome and counter demonstrators are not welcome, they're essentially just renting private space to people and there's not really a charter implication. So while I would defend personally, and I don't, I don't there's people in the who wouldn't agree with this, but when I would personally defend the right for neo-Nazis to go and, and stand on a soapbox at a public park, right, there's an opportunity for people to stand up to them, right, yell in their face, tell them to go home, and, and that's, that's a healthy society, right, when you tell a Nazi to F off and go home. When they create a private space, they're de facto endorsing what occurs there, right? They're saying, yeah, you can use our space for X, Y, or Z, and there's, there's no um, pushback. Conversely, um, these organizations have a right to provide a, a discrimination-free space for their students or for people who like to go to the library. And that's actually like a legal responsibility of theirs. They cannot provide discriminatory service. They cannot make one group feel less safe on campus you know, than another, right? They have a legal obligation actually not to host those events, not to provide a private space for them. Now, if those hate groups showed up anyways and just tried to hold it in like the parking lot, the university couldn't do too much about it. In that case, I hope they'd like encourage a counter demonstration. So there's that important private public distinction when you're talking about um, speech issues. Uh, now, a lot of universities, uh, libraries, et cetera, will also argue that by making their space available to anybody who comes and seeks it, you know, they're promoting um, the free exchange of ideas, et cetera, and so forth. Um, we are past the point of needing to debate whether the ideas in my comp are, are worth discussing uh, or, or the rights of others, right? Um, my position on, on this kind of stuff is, you know, you cannot use your status as like a discriminating group, for example, to discriminate against others. You cannot say like, oh, I'm a Christian, therefore I, I have a right to, to hate people. No, it doesn't work like that. Um, so, but when universities and libraries say that they are trying to provide an open venue for the exchange of ideas and the free marketplace of ideas, Here's the counter to that, right? When you provide certain groups with spaces that can like afford to book those spaces, and they're gonna hold a rally saying that trans women aren't women, for example, or that trans women are, are a danger to women and girls, right? Um, you are in effect silencing trans women everywhere because you're making it harder for them to participate in public because they're being discriminated against, and you're making it harder for them to, to be a wholehearted supporter of like the library the university, for example, right? Or when you privilege the, the opinions of one group, like, like hate groups, you are removing privilege from, from other groups who also have free expression rights. Um, so that's kind of how I see the, the free expression issue when it, comes, when it comes to hate groups, right? We should draw the line at what they have uh, a legal right to, and that, that legal right is important, right? People have a right to, to free expression, but when their free expression starts to um, deprioritize, you know, marginalized groups that are protected by our laws, then that's, you know, where we draw the line. Okay. okay. Uh, just, just to follow up on the, uh, and that's very useful, and I, obviously, you know, the balancing of the freedom of speech versus the right to be free from hateful speech is a, is a discussion that's been going on for decades, and I suspect it will continue. Um, Regarding deep, uh, going back to deplatforming again, just for a moment, um, I was reading an article uh, several weeks ago talking about where the people went online when 8chan, which is one of the, a part of the dark web, went went offline, and they talked about how these folks ended up going to another platform called Telegram. One of the comments made by uh, made by researchers was that every time these folks get deplatformed. They eventually find a better way of coming together, and in a sense, by deplatforming them, we are hastening along their their evolution, if you will, uh, into smarter and more clever uh, opponents. Um, any any comments on that? Yeah, a couple. I mean, um, we see the opposite, right? We see this stuff every day when when they lose a platform, for example. Another common criticism of that is that. Uh, 
if you take away their platform, they're going to go someplace secret, more secret, and darker, and get even more extreme, or even become more attractive for people to see them out. Not true. Just, I'm, it's not true, right? Um, that's absolutely not what we observe, not what any of us who do this work observe. Um, when they lose a platform uh, and they go someplace they think is more secret, surprise, we're, we're there, right? We, we monitor them pretty closely. Um, so every time they flee a platform, we're in whatever the next one is. And uh, it doesn't make it, making it more taboo or harder to find, you know, doesn't make it more attractive, it makes it harder to find. So when, when you take down one of their forums, for example, you know, that kid who's like watching the videos and stuff and ready to take that next step and network with other individuals, they have a really hard time finding a place to network with other individuals. That's a disruption point in their radicalization, right? They might find something else, somebody else might get to them and talk to them, you know, or point them on the right path again. Um, when they move to other platforms like, like Telegram, you know, for example, what that means is that the only way to find them is to know how to find them. They're not like on Facebook and like just broadly spreading their message and sucking new people in. Every time they move to a new platform, they have a drop off in how many people make that jump, right? So let's say they're on Facebook doing their thing. You them get Facebook fans, they're like, oh, Facebook's controlled by Jesus. So move to Telegram. Okay, great. They move to Telegram and like half of their audience makes that move. Um, and that's the thing, right? We've seen many prominent far right figures saying that by being removed from the traditional platforms, the larger social media platforms, they can't make any money anymore. They don't have any power. They're becoming irrelevant. And then it's true. Like, so, so even though, you know, yeah, they're getting smarter. They're learning how to like do X, Y, or Z. We're usually a step ahead of them. And, um, and every time their audience drops off, they're less able to reach people ready to be radicalized or children or, or the general public with their message. So it makes them more fringe and more fringe and more fringe and more fringe until when you take half of a half of a half of a half of a half, what are you left with? Like a few handful of Nazis that meet together in person in, in a basement? Like, okay, I'm, I'm satisfied. We're never gonna beat neo-Nazism, but we, if we can drive it back to a handful of losers in a basement, I'm perfectly happy with that. Okay. All right. No, that, no, that, that's useful. By the way, uh, we are, uh, some folks have said that we are getting a little bit of breakup. So when you answer, uh, Evan, if you can just perhaps speak just a little bit slower and give the technology a chance to keep up uh, with your flow. Sure. Okay. Uh, a question from our audience, uh, and this is related to political entryism, which was one of the items on your challenges and opportunities foil. Uh, has the People's Party of Canada official party status been questioned, used their links to far-right groups? Could they be sanctioned or have their status revoked? Uh, short answer is, is no. Um, and the reason being that there is nothing in our Elections Act which judges the content of a party. And that's kind of why we can't keep out full-blown neo-Nazi parties either. Uh, basically, the only rules to like have a party and continue to have party status are you, know, you got to have 250 people to sign up to be a party, and to continue to have party status, all you got to do is file some basic paperwork that you know even weirdos that get like 300 votes manage to manage to do. So, short answer is is no. I mean, in terms of being sanctioned, have their status revoked. Uh, I would note that there is a lawsuit right now. Um, actually, there is a, a an activist in Winnipeg who worked to get an, uh, a PPC event canceled at an art gallery. Um, and he did, right? The art gallery made the principal decision. The team came together. They were all very polite in how it was handled. It was a big, nice, happy win, right? As a result, the PPC organizer in the area called him a terrorist. You know, and this, is, this was a Muslim, Muslim man. And said other, you know, nasty things about him, identified you know, his phone number, his address, his place of business, and called him a terrorist, right? Endangering this person. And also sure. slandering, you know, defaming this person. Uh, that, those kind of um, comments were, I, I can't quite recall if both rebroadcasted and defended or one or the other, but by, by PPC candidate. Um, and, and this individual, you know, this Muslim man uh, who was, he was defamed, uh, is suing, um, that, that organizer, those candidates, and the People's Party of Canada, you know, writ large. Uh, and there is precedent in this country for calling uh, a Muslim person you know, a terrorist, when it's not true, as, as not just defamatory, but kind of relying on the most base, you know, anti-Muslim stereotypes and, and of hate speech. 
right? That's been recommended by our court. Okay. One. Um, so on a number of your uh, slides, you uh, you talked about the recruitment efforts and the attractiveness of uh, the message uh, that these groups are promoting. So. While it's dangerous to try to reduce a problem to a single type, is there a profile for the sort of person who would be most easily recruited uh, to the extreme right? Sure. So, uh, yes, there is a type. I mean, there are non-white members of the anti-Muslim movement and even a few in the, in the already neo-Nazi movement. But uh, we've got to talk about the movement separately. So generally speaking, um, in the alt-right neo-Nazi movement, members are between 16 and 25 to 30 is probably the majority of their of their membership, and we're talking white white men. Uh, those that they try to target and radicalize and recruit, um, there are some common kind of uh, features uh, about them. And again, this is not I'm not saying this is definitive, right? But these are kind of warning signs. Uh, social isolation outside of these online communities, right, that, that prey on them. Uh, frustration with, with women or the status of women, um, you know, being, being sexually frustrated, feeling that not only are they uh, unable to get, get, you know, the attraction of women, but that uh, they are owed women, right? And, and that really toxic aspect of it plays a lot into this. Um, they are generally, and there's ways to spot it, but in the early days, you know, they will oppose political correctness. They will be following far-right uh, individuals. Um, a lot of them today, from the alt-right neo-Nazi movement, come from not the most broken backgrounds, uh, but they can. Uh, but they're more socially upward mobile, like uh, upwardly mobile today than they have been in history. Now, when it comes to the more old-school neo-Nazi stuff, which still exists, then you're talking a bit more about kids from broken homes. You're talking a bit more about uh, really bad socioeconomic backgrounds. You're talking about issues like that play more of a role. But again, not not definitive, and not um, not saying that will happen to people like that, right? When it comes to the um, anti-Muslim movement, uh, those individuals tend to be much older, especially the non-militant groups. But we're talking, generally speaking, you know, 40 plus. Uh, these are individuals who um, have a variety of social economic difficulties, um, and I, you know, I'm, I'm sometimes tired when people kind of dance around this. So I, I like just saying it straight out, right? But these are very stupid. We're talking people whose education system has entirely failed, uh, whether it would have been successful with them in the first place or not, right? Uh, they're susceptible to conspiracy theories. Um, and they promote celebrate violence, right? Um, so that's kind of the the individuals you're dealing with in the, in the anti Muslim movement, especially. Um, so yeah, while there isn't like a stereotypical one kind of person, those are some of the aspects that might um, might speak to the demographics of who's involved in those two movements. Yeah. Uh, so one one last one last question uh, for you, Evan. Um, so uh, there are a couple of terms that uh, that I've seen uh, quite often in uh, right wing literature, things like uh, the white genocide and the great replacement. Uh, I don't think you uh, referenced those in your presentation. I wonder if you could just take a minute or two just to uh, talk about those. You know, are they significant? Uh, are they germane to, uh, to the topic today? Yeah, so the, the Great Replacement or, or White Genocide, which is, um, uh, they're synonyms for one another. Uh, uh, yes, uh, very dangerous um, and incorrect concepts that have inspired uh, terrorist attacks. And uh, they're fundamental building blocks of uh, uh, both movements, actually, of just right extremism today in general. Basically, what it says is that um, white people are being demographically replaced, right? They're saying that, uh, you know, in, in by 2050, you know, white people will be a uh, minority in X, Y, Z country. Okay. Um, now, I mean, I, my background is in psychology and sociology. Uh, 
So we did study demographic um, changes. Uh, and of course we don't study it. And, and that's kind of the difference that I want to that I want to point out here. They say that there is an agenda behind it. And that's that's the important part. That's where conspiracy theory comes in. Um, so they say that this is being orchestrated by quote unquote globalists or sometimes they just drop the that word to say Jews, right? They're saying that you know they are promoting degeneracy in society, which they define as you know homosexuality, uh, which they define as um, feminism. And they're saying that they're doing this to reduce the white birth rate at the same time as bringing in, you know, quote, like hordes of third worlders, end quote. And the net result is to wipe out white people, which is what the Jews wanted all along. Um, so that's the belief. And, and the important part here is this is not a discussion of demographic change, right? I mean, those discussions happen in universities. Yes, we have changing demographics in our country. White people simply do not have enough children. Uh, in, in, need, in order for our country to be sustainable and, and young and vibrant and, uh, and adaptable, we need to bring in, uh, we need immigration and, and, you know, those people become Canadian and we're a stronger country for it. It's all, it's all wonderful. Good. Now, when they discuss it, though, in that conspiracy theory, when they say that white people are being genocided, right, there is a motive there. They're blaming that on certain groups. And the issue is when you blame something like that on certain groups and you say, this is the apocalypse, right? This is the apocalypse for white people like you and certain groups are responsible, right? Even if they stop there, there is an implicit call for action to stop the situation, right? When all the rhetoric surrounding it um, supports violence towards either immigrants or the people, quote unquote, like coordinating this in the Jews, that's when you get terrorist attacks, right? You tell somebody there's an apocalypse, you tell them what the problem is, you tell them who's doing the problem, and then you encourage them to take violent action to remedy the problem. And that's when you see terrorist attacks like the Christchurch Manifesto, for example, which explicitly referenced the Great Replacement Theory. Evan, thank you very much for that. And thank you for taking the time uh, to, to share you know, to share your experiences uh, and your knowledge uh, with uh, with our participants. Um, for those who are with for those who are listening online, uh, we will in the next few days have a uh, copy of the uh, of Evan's presentation. Certainly the uh, certainly the the, uh, the audio uh, of it. And Evan, I guess if you can make uh, the PowerPoint available, uh, we can put that up as well. Uh, and uh, Evan, before we sign off, uh, you had mentioned uh, you know the work that's being done by the Canadian Anti Hate Network. Would you like to give folks uh, the website or uh, or the Facebook info so that they can continue to follow if they wish? Sure. And uh, like any small organization, our our social media presence is actually better than our, our website. So I would I would direct people to check us out at Facebook.com/slash/AntiHateCA. All one all one word: AntiHateCA. Or the same thing at Twitter, we're at anti ca and that's where we put out most of our information. Uh, we also act in partnership with uh, Anti-Racist Canada and Yellow Bus Canada Exposed. Uh, together, we're probably the bulk of uh, kind of hate group research in English-speaking Canada. Um, and uh, you can find them on Twitter uh, as well, uh, at uh, Anti-Racist Canada, the ARC Collective, and uh, Yellow Bus Canada Exposed, uh, or at Best. Canada. Excellent. Evan, again, thank you very much for, uh, for spending time with us this afternoon, and thank you to our participants uh, for taking the time to listen to this presentation. Please do uh, keep checking back to the Canadian Race Relations Foundation website uh, to receive information about this presentation when it's posted, and of course, other presentations and webinars uh, as uh, they are scheduled. Thank you all, and have a great afternoon. Thank you.